Bienvenidos. 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 Welcome, Welcome to, to the Learn Spanish, Spanish con Salsa, Salsa Podcast. Podcast. Here's your host, Certified Language Coach, Tamara Marie. Hola, bienvenidos al podcast Learn Spanish con Salsa. Welcome to another episode of the Learn Spanish con Salsa podcast. I'm your host, Tamara Marie, and I am joined today by one of our newest members of the team at Spanish con Salsa. So we are going to be talking all about uh, her life and how she came to become a language coach and teacher. And I think you'll be fascinated by her story because I think a lot of times we think it's hard to learn another language or maybe we have some obstacles in the way and we're really not sure if we're ever going to get fluent. And I think her story really will help inspire you that even if you feel like you're stuck in your language learning journey, that it is absolutely possible for you to become bilingual um, no matter what your age, no matter what your circumstances. So I'm excited to introduce our, our newest member of the team of Spanish Con Salsa. Um, and she is from Puerto Rico. So we're gonna be talking a little bit about uh, how she grew up, how she became a teacher. And of course, when we end, I'll talk about how you can join her um, if you wanna learn more about Puerto Rican Spanish as well. So I would like to say bienvenida. Uh, Marla Rivera, welcome to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. Thank you, Tamara. Pleasure to be here. So Marla, I know that um, one of the reasons why I was really impressed with you is because I know we initially talked, you were uh, explaining that you are an interpreter, which I think is a whole different set of skills. I think a lot of people just think that uh, someone who knows multiple languages should just be able to translate for them on the fly. I know I get asked <laughs> that all the time. People are like, oh, can you tell me what they said? I'm like, okay, I can. But like, I, it, this is a lot, right? You've got to do translation um, of not just the words, but the meaning and in real time. Uh, and I've had a few interpreters on the podcast before and I'm always amazed. So <laughs> um, why don't you start out first before we get into all of uh, how you became an interpreter? Because I think that's a fascinating story. Uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you grew up um, and how it is that you got into language learning. Of course. Um, so I am from Guaynabo, Puerto Rico. I grew up with my parents, my two siblings, and uh, in the middle, middle north or east region of the island. And I started teaching, uh, well, right before that, I started learning languages myself. I learned French and then American Sign Language simultaneously. And I started by learning how to interpret American Sign Language. And by that, I gra grabbed... Uh, this love for learning languages and from that I discovered how to you know grow that into a love for teaching languages and I had students I taught English to and uh, tutored on my own free time and they helped me with American Sign Language and then I went and as a part-time job I taught Spanish Wow. So you learned French and American Sign Language at the yes. same time. So <laughs> what made you want to learn ASL and, and French? Like what, what drew you to those two uh, languages specifically? Uh, French is, it was the, the country, France, and I always wanted to go to France and learn what they're saying and be able to, you know, navigate and watch movies and all that and without having to use subtitles and it was such an interesting culture and different language that i really wanted to know uh you know how, what it was all about and american sign language uh because it's so expressive it is very alive very vivid like you have to use your whole body and your facial expression otherwise you're giving it a whole other meaning to the sign you can give it a whole other like sarcastic meaning to a sign if you you have a neutral face when you're supposed to have a happy face for example and that really drew me i was seeing uh deaf people or people like interpreters signing around the island and that drew me to that also i had a friend that was taking classes and he suggested i would take classes and i would practice with him as well and that really uh allowed me to grow and start loving the language Wow. Okay. So I do have questions about this because we do have two other members of our team that are, that know ASL. Um, so Kessia and Hael both uh, mm. have that background. And I've always been curious about this because 
in English, I know we have, I mean, it's American sign language, right? So, um, there, there's a certain way of expression, but then we also have sort of like a black American sign language, which apparently is more expressive. And so is it different? Do you find in like Puerto Rico, like the, the way and the expressions, um, is it different than what you might find here in the United States on the mainland as far as yes. how people, um, sign and how they express themselves? It's a bit different. Uh, some signs in Puerto Rico are only Puerto Rican. Uh, only somebody from the island would use them. And some signs are straight from the mainland uh, U.S. Um, I haven't interacted with a lot of deaf uh, communities here in the mainland. I haven't found uh, many where I live. But I'm living in Indiana currently. But in, from what I've been taught, from my deaf teachers that did live in Indiana, uh, sorry, not Indiana, <laughs> the U.S., uh, they did teach me that so this sign, you know, uh, people don't use it in the U.S., this sign they do. And I would say Puerto Rico, they're even slightly more expressive from what they taught me because only because Puerto Ricans are very loud and expressive by nature, not to take away from the U.S. deaf community but only because we are more uh, touchy, more loving, uh, expressing our love physically and more expressive by nature itself. Okay, that's interesting. I think that that's similar to like Black American Sign Language because there is a little bit more expressiveness. More and I've, yeah. I've heard from the deaf community, um, uh, the Black community is that they they feel that American sign language is a bit stifling because it's like they have to fit into these rigid ways. So yep. could you, because now I'm just curious because I find this whole thing fascinating. Could you maybe give us an example of a sign that's different in Puerto Rico versus in mainland U.S.? For us, it was, if I'm not mistaken, it was P-R, Puerto Rico. And mm -hmm. then in the U.S., they also say P-R, like, they separate instead of putting the island, they put oh okay P R, and we oh, put so the just island. the letters. Yeah. Ah, okay. So the hand at the bottom is kind of like the island. Or the island. Ah, okay. That's interesting. Now I do remember like my like letters in ASL, but I don't remember like the. <laughs> I have very limited vocabulary with that, but um, that is fascinating. Okay, so you you learned ASL, then you learned French. You said that you were interested because you wanted to visit France potentially yes. one day. So how would you say the process was for you learning them both at the same time? Because I know for a lot of people, like just learning one language can be overwhelming. So how did you <laughs> approach? I mean, I know they're very different too, so that may have helped, right? Um, but how did you approach learning them both at the same time? You're right. They're very different and that did help um, because ASL has a different structure. But it helped also in the sense that I had a bachelor. I was taking a bachelor's in French. That's my bachelor's in Puerto Rico, in the University of Puerto Rico, uh, from Monday to Friday. And my ASL classes were only Saturday, every Saturday for three or four months, uh, every semester. And it was multiple uh, semesters. And that helped in the sense that is less workload, knowing that in the week I only study um, certain days. Uh, my homework for the university and then I also constantly have one day in the week during the week that I study ASL and then do the homework and also do the meetings in person to better the sign language and then in weekends and Saturday I would go and do the in-person class. Okay, so it sounds like you had like a really good time management schedule set up where you, <laughs> Thank you. you know, you had time dedicated for languages and it probably also helped that you were dedicating your studies to it in university. So you definitely had the yes. time yes. To, to learn French. So answer me this question, because I know a lot of people listen to this podcast have had different experiences learning languages in a school or academic mm -hmm. environment. So how was your experience learning French in Puerto Rico? Was it, did you feel like when you came out of that, you were able to have a conversation in French and that you were conversational mm -hmm. or, or did you have to supplement that with things you did outside of your classes to really feel comfortable speaking the language? I would say that I did feel like I came out being able to talk French, but at the same time, 
to lessen the nerves of talking to a French native, I would need to supplement that either with a French native or with another French learner. What we would do is we would meet in the hallways and we would practice among our friends from French class. And I have friends in French class and friends outside of it that also knew French. And I would talk to them every chance I got because talking to a French native was very daunting back then. Um, I still sometimes feel nervous, <laughs> even though I am better. I'm uh, way better than I was back then. I still feel that, you know, that those nerves at the beginning. But after a while, they, they go away eventually. Yeah. And do you have a lot of opportunity to speak French, like to maintain it? Or do you still do you still have conversations in French regularly or listen to things in French? Unfortunately, not conversations. I do listen to movies and mm. um, with the subtitles and with the audio in French and uh, music. I listen to a lot of uh, French music, specifically okay. Stromae. Uh, I love that singer. <laughs> Oh, nice. Nice. Okay. So I think it's interesting too, because, um, you know, in the process of learning a language, like you mentioned, like those nerves in the beginning, you're like, oh, yeah, I don't want to talk to a native speaker. Cause you know, it's like, oh, you're freeze up. Maybe yes. I'll understand them. <laughs> then what am I going to say? Um, uh, I think a lot of people listen can relate to that. I was going to ask you if there was a moment where, you know, in your language learning journey, whether it was with ASL or French, um, and even English, because we haven't talked about that, because I imagine growing up in Puerto Rico, you, you learned both Spanish and English in school. Um, was there ever a moment when you felt like, oh, I think I actually know what I'm doing now, or, or like, I feel like I may actually be fluent <laughs> yes. in this language? Like, did you have a moment? Because I know for me, yes. so I'll share like briefly, like, so one of the things that happened to me earlier on in my learning Spanish is I went to Mexico and I got food poisoning, which I mean, not novel uh, experience for Mexico, unfortunately. <laughs> and I was sitting in this hotel and it had to be like three o'clock in the morning. I was like sick. I needed, I was like, I, it was just me and my son. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And so I called the front desk and they put, a, they put a doctor on the phone to talk to me and he didn't speak English. So I had to explain to this doctor what my symptoms were in Spanish. Um, the hotel sent someone to my room to go get me medicine that the doctor told me that I should take. I had to transact all this money to give him money to go get the medicine, to bring it back, to read the instructions, to take yep. the medicine all at like 3 a.m. when I was clearly <laughs> like not my best self, yeah. right? <laughs> and um, after I got out of that, I made it back to the U.S. without dying. <laughs> I was like, That's I, 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 you got it. <laughs> I feel like I might be fluent now because if I was able to do all of that at 4 a.m., like when I was up, like, yes. and, well, we'll share the details. <laughs> Um, not in my best state. I felt like I was doing pretty good. <laughs> so hopefully yours rough. wasn't like food poisoning, <laughs> but like, did you have a moment like that where you realized like, I really think I'm fluent now. I think I got this. <laughs> yes. Um, specifically when, um, after I graduated and moved to the U S well, with my husband, I was in a taxi and the, the taxi was taking us to a hotel because we were um, staying with family. We were reunited. We were already living in the States, but the family was visiting in Chicago. So we took our car somewhere and then we took a taxi uh, farther out to the hotel. Um, for some reason, I don't remember why. And, and I remember that the taxi driver uh, was Haitian and his first language was French. He knew Creole, he knew French, and he knew English. And when I heard that, I asked him, um, oh, you said you were from uh, from Haiti, right? And I, all in French. And I started talking to him in French. He's like, oh, you speak very well. <laughs> well we're, and we started speaking like, oh, where are you from? Uh, where did you study? How long have you been speaking French? You speak it super well. And that moment when he understood everything being a french native uh i was like i think i got this <laughs> yeah especially i think talking to someone from from haiti because i imagine his accent was a little bit different than like yes, someone from france different. or from paris so yeah wow that's really cool yeah i think those moments always kind of let us know like oh, okay so i haven't been wasting my time because i think with <laughs> yeah. learning languages so it sometimes just feels like you're not making progress, right? So having yeah, those experiences, kind of yeah. yeah, it like sometimes. proves to you that like, even though you're scared, 
even though you feel like you're not prepared, you get through it. And I think that's exactly. when we could like say, oh, okay, maybe, maybe I'm not doing so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I know that feeling. <laughs> so, so talk to you a little bit about growing up in Puerto Rico. So you mentioned, um, you know, sort of growing up and learning ASL in French and university, but how, how did you learn English? Did you, cause I know just different friends I have in Puerto Rico, um, depending on where you were on the island and how your family was, you may or may not have learned English conversationally. Yes. You may have just learned it in school. Um, mm -hmm. And I've heard even some teachers don't speak English very well or at all. They just kind of teach it. So talk a little bit about growing up bilingual in a bilingual you know, area. Like how, how was that for you? And how did you feel about your English and Spanish skills as you were um, kind of growing up in Puerto Rico? So I grew up in the metro area and that area um had a lot of schools that are known to have uh either american schools american military schools uh private schools even and and it does also have uh, public schools but i went to a public school first and then a private school and but since i was very little i knew english because of tv I will watch everything in TV. If my parents bought me any books, any music, anything, it was all in English because they wanted me to know the language, not just Spanish. And they saw that I would grasp it quickly like my brother. And they just let me keep going. Everything, absolutely everything was in English. And when I was two or three, they said I was saying full sentences in English. All the colors, all the, you know, everything the little kids would do, animals, colors letters everything i already was talking in english completely and from there it was all high school elementary everything uh i had good teachers in uh for english class uh fortunately and but it does what you said that there's a lot of teachers that don't uh speak english very well they just teach it but they don't have a good accent or a good command of it that is very true unfortunately for a lot of people both in private and public schools it happens everywhere on the island and it has to do a lot with the older generation seeing English as the colonizer's language. Because Puerto Rico, as many of you may know, is a territory, as a U.S. territory. And since it is a U.S. territory, the older generation, my grandparents, my parents' generation, they're like, oh, I'll, you know, I'll finish the uh, English class. I'll get it over with. I'm not using that ever again. I don't need it. I don't want it kind of thing. That was how they view it back then. Since my, since Gen X, my sister's generation and my generation, we've been really accepting of it. Uh, uh, that's because I say that because I see a lot of, um, of my sister's age, 34, 35 and slightly younger that are very accepting and know English very well. Yeah, I think it also depends on the area, you know, because you mentioned being in the metro area. So I imagine it was a little bit different there, too, just yes. because it's probably more tourism, more people. I found the further That's I left San Juan out of the outskirts, <laughs> the less likely it was for people to speak uh, English. Um, that as well, yes. So it's, yeah, it's really interesting, interesting dynamic. I, I definitely find on the island. And you also mentioned, like, the coloni colonizer's language. So not to get too far into like the political <laughs> situation, <laughs> but um, how do you feel about that in terms of just, cause obviously you're, you're in the mainland now and you speak English very well, you speak Spanish. So what, what is kind of your take on that idea of like Puerto Rico being independent or just the culture being this really bilingual culture? Um, what, like how, what do you, what do you kind of feel about that? I feel like it's fine being a bilingual culture because it's, you know, it has a beautiful blend of both. But if Puerto Rico somehow magically, you know, someday becomes independent, I don't see it coming anytime <laughs> soon. But if it does, I wouldn't mind it. It'll be awesome. But right now, uh, as a mix of both cultures, I think it's fine. Because we, having Latino culture and American culture doesn't take away from the Latino culture. It's very much prevalent. And anybody that will that goes to Puerto Rico can can see that the Latino is very prevalent. It's not uh, suppressed currently by the American culture. Maybe it was back then, in my grandparents' mm -hmm. time, you know, because there was a lot of laws. Not mm -hmm. now, though. Oh, that's interesting. It's funny. I think one of the last few times I went to Puerto Rico, I was on a farm. And I think I said something about Latino culture. And he kind of scoffed at me and said, we're not Latinos. 
you know, we're from the, we're from the Caribbean. That's like, that's different. I was like, oh my bad. Sorry. Like he was just very much like, I don't know what you're talking about. You American. I was yeah, like, that, okay. That's a, uh, that's <laughs> weird take because we're very much like, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a weird take, yeah. Yeah, he was just like, no, we're not Latino. But I also find Latino as a term just seems to be something that only comes into play when you leave where you're from. Like when you're in Puerto Rico, you're not walking around going, I'm a Latino. You're like, well, I'm Puerto Rican, right? Like I'm in Puerto like, you know, like I think that's a very American thing just to say that you are a Latino because it's something like I feel like is more invented by being in the diaspora and being away from home because you mainly would just identify with home like if you're there you know yeah, <laughs> it's that, like i don't walk around <laughs> saying i'm american um you know or whatever it like until i go somewhere and I have to show my passport it becomes obvious but it's not something i think about <laughs> day to day but yeah it was just funny yes, that he said i was like oh he's all right yeah you're that's caribbean <laughs> got it okay dude sorry um <laughs> So, so when did you move uh, from Puerto Rico to the mainland? I moved in 2017 uh, to uh, first to Illinois, then to mm -hmm. Ohio for my husband's job, and then uh, here in Indiana. And Illinois was first because that's where I got my master's for interpreting and translation. Okay. Yeah, that's a great segue. So let's talk about interpreting. So how is it that you became an interpreter? Because I know some people listening are probably interested in uh, becoming an interpreter. So um, what were the qualifications? Like what was the process you went through? And was it, did you find it difficult? Like what was the most difficult part about um, just going from, oh, I'm, I'm bilingual to being uh, an interpreter? I was... Um interested in languages uh like i said before for many years since even before learning french and american sign language i was interested in english before that and i grasped english from a very young age but when people were starting pointing out that i knew english you know you don't think about it when you know it natively like i do uh because i grew up bilingual but when people started pointing out that i knew english very well i'm like oh yeah I guess I do. And I started looking in, in, in more into English, like reading more on um, purpose, because before I didn't used to read books out of school. So I started furthering my education into English. And then that turned into a love for language uh, further on with French and American Sign Language. And when I was exposed to American Sign Language interpreters, I was like, that's what I want to do. But I'm not sure for what language. And then uh, looking up information online, I was confident that I wanted to do it for English and Spanish specifically, seeing that there's a lot of need for that. And back then, I didn't have confidence to interpret professionally for French and American Sign Language. So that's how I got to the decision of, of specifically going for Spanish and English. And after that, it was a matter of looking for where. So I searched uh, interpreting schools and I found a very good one, uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. They have a top, very amazing program for languages, foreign languages department is top notch. And from there, it, the qualifications were having a proficiency test for your second language. In this case, it would be mine technically English. But I took that online, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, it's been a long time. But if I'm not mistaken, I took it online. And also having a certain amount of credits from your university. And I had mine available for um, my bachelor's. And other than that, being a U.S. resident or a citizen or having a visa. And then... Um, that was it. Like, there's no specific, like, other, like, the, just the language test, the credits, and uh, the citizen or resident or visa requirements. Okay, so once you got into the program, what was it, what was the training like to become an interpreter? Like, how many hours did you have to do? Like, what types of things that um, were different from just, like, you know, when you were learning French in university? Like, what, what did your program for interpretation kind of um, emphasize? For interpretation, it was um, 
the different techniques interpretation for example there's what is called whispering interpretation which is when the the interpreter is in a conference a political conference or walking with a diplomat and they're walking and greeting everybody um or it's a conference and the interpreter sits behind the person and there's multiple people uh with different interpreters so you can't you know say it out loud or and they don't have available the headsets and all that you see on on movies um so you have to sit behind the person and whisper in their ear what they're saying and and say it uh loudly back if somebody wants to uh hear the person you're speaking to if that person wants to say something loud back then that interpreter will take over but otherwise just whisper interpreting they would also focus on different techniques and teach you how to use the the course the theory uh they would teach you different theories different techniques for memorization breaking down information uh the pacing and of course the system the sound system and the sound proof room where interpreters would plug in into the mic if it's a big conference with a one speaker and a podium the interpreter would uh, plug in into that audio and then would speak into people's headphones and that's how uh we do that and also we also train in relay interpreting which would be one interpreter does it for one certain amount of time and then they signal to their partner in the booth and that person uh, at a certain moment when the interpreter that's interpreting gives them the signal immediately they would switch without like literally two seconds gap and they would take over in the basically the same sentence and they also train in consecutive interpreting which is uh you talk i interpret and then you talk i interpret like that and simultaneous interpreting which is the one for the for the podium i just explained the podium is speaking and i constantly interpret non-stop mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. wow so i didn't realize there are that many different different styles different types of interpreting yes. what what would you say is the most challenging thing about being an interpreter the most challenging thing it would be retaining the information for simultaneous interpreting i would say oh that that one is very difficult simultaneous interpreting is one is in my opinion and in a lot of interpreters opinion that i have heard it is the most difficult um method of interpreting because it requires you to do three things at the same time listen retain uh, or memorize and verbalize the message all at the same time you're listening one language let's say it's english you're memorizing that and uh, and then at the same time i am uh, interpreting into spanish the previous sentence but memorizing the the next sentence and listening to the next sentence after that that is extremely difficult the other second most difficult thing i would say is uh minute details like numbers that's why they they tell you to write it down and they give you techniques uh they teach you techniques to writing stuff down as well it takes uh i think you also asked me about hours like every semester mm-hmm. it took two years the, the program by the way it's two years every semester was like 30 hours for the interpreting class but i also took translation so i took a lot of mm-hmm. classes in translation as well Wow. Wow. That does sound like a, I, I could just see me trying to like remember and, and like just blanking or forgetting <laughs> something. It is so very what difficult. Would, what would you say either in just either in interpreting or just like in, in language learning in general, what would you say is either like the most embarrassing or funniest mistake you've ever made <laughs> in another language? Um, in another language, I think I have the most embarrassing <laughs> that was kind of funny was i changed the gender accidentally of the person speaking it was a man but the person i was talking that that man was talking to was an officer and she was female so i was talking as the officer to the man and the man said uh senora which is ma'am in spanish so when i was uh when he said that i said ma'am to her saying his message and when she relayed back sir uh senor i said senora again accidentally and it's like oh 
I'm sorry. <laughs> so I interpret her correct. Sorry, ma'am. Senor. <laughs> senor was sorry. <laughs> and he laughed. He didn't care. But it was kind of I was like, my bad. <laughs> well, I would say from 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 all the stories I've heard over the years of people learning languages, that's probably the most mild mistake. <laughs> like, like for for so if that's your your most embarrassing one, that's really good. Like excuse me, you're you're pretty proficient <laughs> at languages. So do you have a favorite word or phrase and it could be in French or or English or Spanish? Like, do you just have like a, a favorite phrase that you like that's maybe unique to the language or says something about the culture? Um, I would say awesome. I like say, I just say it a lot. I don't know. What, I just like it. <laughs> the word <laughs> awesome in English, I, it's just fun to say it, it expresses so much it's always so positive i just like yeah. that word and the most similar thing that i can think of in uh in spanish specifically uh puerto rican spanish uh brutal it is like the closest okay. thing to awesome ah, i also so say brutal example. a lot <laughs> <laughs> give me an example of how you use brutal because i was thinking chevere because i think that's what most people chevere, say, we like, also use there. that a lot <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. I, I write so that example. but yeah uh, how brutal? would you use brutal um if we're saying oh dude that party was awesome last night you should have been there where were you in spanish it would be eh, pana ese esa fiesta estaba brutal donde tu estaba te lo perdiste like that <laughs> we also say chevere a lot i actually type chevere a lot but in person uh -huh. i'm finding myself to say brutal specifically uh -huh. to other puerto ricans because that is very puerto that's a puerto rican term and if mm -hmm. you say it outside of puerto rico i don't think a lot of spanish speakers would know what you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> yeah because in english it's like translates it sounds like brutal it's like oh that was it horrible, does sound right? like <laughs> yeah <laughs> it sounds rough exactly like brutal, right. rough. <laughs> it's like was that a good party or not like you know <laughs> <laughs> so are you saying it's a bad party <laughs> right right <laughs> All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Marla. Gracias for sharing a little bit about uh, yourself and, and your experience learning languages. And I hope that somebody listening, if they felt like, wow, I'm just struggling to get fluent in Spanish, that, you know, it is possible to, to learn multiple languages and even languages that are very different. So um, thank you for sharing your experience. And hopefully we'll get you back on the podcast soon to share more about Puerto Rican Spanish. Thank you for having me. And that is going to be it for this episode of the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast. I hope you have enjoyed this episode, that you learned something new. So if you're thinking about being an interpreter or you just want to get to a state where you are speaking Spanish fluently, I hope Marla's story is encouraging to you. And also, if you're interested in learning more Spanish, um, either from Puerto Rico or just conversational Spanish uh, from Latin America in general, uh, definitely go to our website, LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. Uh, the link for this episode, we will include some information about how you can sign up for a free language coaching session. If you want to learn Spanish with Marla or any other member of our team here at Spanish Con Salsa, we have a very conversational approach. So if you've been, you know, learning Spanish with an app or maybe you took some classes in high school and that high school Spanish is not getting you where you want to be, make sure you go to LearnSpanishConSalsa.com. Uh, we will definitely uh, be able to help you get past that hump so that you can get some experience speaking Spanish and you get comfortable speaking with native Spanish speakers. As always, I hope something in this episode has helped you go from Spanish beginner to bilingual. Hasta la próxima. Thank you for listening to the Learn Spanish Con Salsa podcast at LearnSpanishConSalsa.com.